Well, what's going on now, sex research today um, is we're in a phase where it has uh, a lot of the funding is going toward finding pharmaceutical solutions to sexual dysfunction. Sex research, you know, in the 50s when it really, really got going, 50s, 60s, 70s was sort of the heyday of bringing people into the lab and for the first time figuring out what, what happens when someone's aroused, what is orgasm, what the heck's going on. So, so a lot of that stuff was, has been done. So there are some pockets of it still going on, which I you know, assiduously sought out and <laughs> visited. But the bulk of the research today uh, is, is moving toward testing drugs for s coming up with products that will then you know, make somebody very wealthy. You know, there was Viagra, and now the, whole, the holy grail is finding something for low libido in postmenopausal women. That's kind of where a lot of the work is. But so AIDS, re yeah, you know, sex research went from the Masters and Johnson era, then moved into when AIDS hit the scene. A lot of the money went toward, you know, transmission of AIDS, risk-taking behavior, uh, getting a handle on that, and then has, since then has moved towards this, you know, dysfunction, helping people who have sexual d dysfunction and looking at solutions, not just pharmaceutical, but other approaches. Someone was looking into the statistic, there's a statistic out there that 70% of women don't have orgasm from sexual intercourse alone. Now that right there is problematic because when you say sex, sexual intercourse, are you talking about is the foreplay involved? Are you just talking? I mean, what was there like a sensual massage? Were you watching porn beforehand? You know, it's it, right there, it's problematic, that, that statistic. But um, there was a researcher who was looking at, you know, why is that figure so low and what makes the difference between the 70% who don't and the 30% who do, and he was looking at the distance between the clitoris and the vagina, which I thought was interesting work, and trying to see, you know, was, is there a correlation, and there does seem to be a correlation. Um, so that kind of basic anatomical, not basic, but that sort of anatomical, physiological exploration, um, I'd like, I'd like to see more of that going on. I understand why people don't do those studies. They're, they're, they tend to um, make your colleagues sort of raise their eyebrows, and uh, it's hard, sometimes hard to get subjects for them. Um, but that, that's that kind of work. And then another area was um, the role of uh, female orgasm in conception, in fertility. And you know, t there's this whole theory, it's called upsuck, around the um, turn of the last century, it was very commonly believed that the contractions of orgasm would sort of pull the semen up through the cervix and rapidly deliver it, and therefore you were more likely to conceive. And even going way back to Hippocrates, physicians used to counsel men, like it's very important, you must titillate your wife prior to intercourse because, you know, her pleasure is necessary, you know, for conception. I mean, now we know it isn't, it isn't necessary, but does it play a role? There's, there are arguments on both sides of that, and that's a really interesting area. I'd love to see more people. There is actually a researcher who was um, is doing some work in that area. So that, that, kind of, um, that kind of work I find fascinating. There's premature ejaculation. People are familiar with that, but then there's, there's actually something called, well, it used to be called retarded ejaculation, but I think that sounded wrong. So now I think it's delayed ejaculation. So there's, there's all these, I mean, male sexual dysfunction tends to just, like, if it's not erectile, it's like, that's all there is. But there's a whole, uh, a whole kind of array of uh, erectile difficulties that are interesting because some people will say, you know, like premature ejaculation is one where there's been papers written that's like, it, why is this a disorder? You know, this actually evolved as a way, uh, you know, in the animal kingdom, the quicker you're done and the quicker you leave, the less likely are you get, to get attacked by a competing male. So it was actually evolutionarily advantageous to be a, a speedy ejaculator. And now it's, been, it's being called a, um, you know, um, you know, a syndrome or a, a dysfunction. So there's all this debate you know, in, the, in, the, uh, in the sexual uh, research communities about that. That was sort of interesting. There's one in women uh, persistent sexual arousal disorder, where, which is a, just this constant sense of being very aroused and not able to kind of conclude or, or you know, not able to get relief. And, and that, you know, people make jokes about, oh, I wish I had that, but, you know, it's actually a, a very troubling condition. There are all kinds of interesting orgasmic disorders that people don't know about. Um, there are spontaneous orgasm. You know, we're talking 30 times a day. There was a case study of a woman 
uh, somewhere in the Middle East who, th th I mean, it destroyed her social life. She, they made a note that she, she could no longer go to shrines <laughs> and practice religious rituals. I mean, they would just be, yeah, you're, you're, uh, your, li your life would be sort of destroyed by something that the rest of us, um, you know, orgasm, it's a, it's a lovely thing, but, you know, you, uh, you can have too much of anything. So there's, uh, there's interesting um, sort of wiring problems that people wear, like there was a man who uh, every time he defecated, he would have an orgasm. I think what happens is it tends to sp spiral one way or the other. I think that, you know, in a conservative administration, people sort of uh, they have a sense that this is going to be... Um, this is going to be a Pandora's box. I don't want to. I don't, I just, it's, my life will be easier if I don't do this study. Why don't I just take a big grant for a fertility study? Everybody can get behind fertility and improving fertility. Uh, so I'll do that to get the money I need, and then I'll sort of on the side do a little bit of this other very interesting work. But I think that once you know, when you do have a sense that there is a more open-minded political element out there that you'll be, there'll be a little bit more of, people will feel a little more safe, a little safer and a little more encouraged, hopefully. But again, you know, it, funding is so far down in all of the sciences and it's all, it's so competitive that um, just to survive, just to get by, people are doing work that they don't have to wonder, are they going to be funded next year or how will they pay for it?